Decades of Discord, Chapter 17, 1875 to 1900. The chapter opens talking about county governments. And good heavens, we certainly have enough counties in our state. They're called little kingdoms, uh, primarily because of isolation. Each one is almost autonomous. The officials there, the county judge, gives you your liquor license. The sheriff collects taxes. The justices of the peace are their local jurists. Your county clerk assesses your property. The officials in the county are the ones who build the roads and maintain them, who help you if you need help financially or some other way. So you have contact with your county officials. Um, the people in Lexington are just names on a piece of paper when you go to vote. They, they, you have no contact with them at all. And these little kingdoms, the county officials, the county judges, they can be disrupted, but usually it's only by a very powerful lobby. And during the time frame we're studying, the most powerful lobby was the l and Railroad. But there could also be disruptions at the polls on Election Day, primarily because it would take days to vote. Uh, liquor was very available. Uh, guns were available. Uh, you could buy a vote for a dollar or a jug of whiskey. It was nothing really unusual, and we have several documented cases of people being elected by the graveyard vote. But with all this problem with the counties or the autonomous, the, the violence is still continuing. It did not end when Reconstruction ended. The regulators were not the KKK, as we said last chapter. The KKK was disbanded officially in 1869. These were people who got together, men, white, who were going to put order in and get rid of some of the violence. And they would arrest you, quote unquote. Uh, they would decide your guilt. They would mete out the punishment. And of course, there was no appeal. And usually when they were around, violence increased because they were the ones committing the violence. And they weren't the only ones doing the meeting out of punishment. There were lynchings going on. Between 1875 and 1900, we have 66 known lynchings. And I say known because a lot of times lynching would take place on somebody's farm or plantation and it wouldn't be documented, but we have 66 documented lynchings. And sometimes they would break into jails and take prisoners from cells. And your text tells you about one in particular where they drug the body through the streets and cut off pieces of the body to sell for souvenirs. It's amazing to me what we humans will do to each other's bodies. And of course, even with all the violence and uh, any supposed wrong that was committed, there was the unwritten law. And I was naive enough to think that when I was young, there really was an unwritten law. It basically talks about, it refers to the male and his honor. If his honor is impugned, not necessarily somebody calling him a liar or anything, although that could be included, but predominantly the spouse being unfaithful and you catching her in a compromising position. You had the uh, right to execute both she and the uh, participating member of the duo. Now, if you were arrested and taken before a grand jury, uh, chances are you had ten folk on it, and there would not be an indictment. And if you were indicted, you would probably would not be convicted because, well, you've got people on the jury, and no one wants to convict a man for you know, standing up for his honor, that that's his word is his bond. His honor is something to be cherished. Even people who enforce the law, such as local sheriffs, are not immune to the violence. And here again, your text relates the fact of uh, some sheriffs being run out of town, uh, being ambushed, judges getting, well, not getting where they're supposed to. They disappeared on their way to somewhere or another. It was so bad, the militia had to be called out, not once, but on several occasions to enforce or maintain the law. And the sad thing is that the public seemed to accept this as usual way of doing business. But it was not unique, not to Kentucky. It was that way throughout the South. It's just Kentucky had the reputation of being the most violent of the southern states. And along with this mob violence, we had something called feud violence. Now, the proper definition of a feud is it takes place over time. It involves family, and the motive has to be revenge. And there have been some that have been labeled feuds that weren't really feuds. I mean, if two families get into a fight and there's maybe some violence or someone gets killed. 
but it takes place at that particular time, uh, spur of the moment type thing. It's not really a feud. The feuds took place predominantly in eastern Kentucky around the Appalachian after the war. And I have uh, one, two, three, four, five listed, the ones that are talked about in your book. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about them because your book does a good job of giving an overall summary. I just want to mention them. Martin Tolliver Logan feud. That took place over three years time with over 20 murders and 16 people getting wounded. The Howard Turner feud in the 1870s. Uh, more than 50 killed and there was a big blowout at the courthouse. The French Eversol feud. 40 to 50 dead which left 50 children without parents. And of course the Hatfield-McCoy feud which was the most famous. And I do have a YouTube posting that I think you'll enjoy. It's one of the shorter to the point ones. And what I found interesting, because I've done some research on this and watched several of the YouTubes. In this particular YouTube, they say it got started over a uh, lawsuit over land. Where the Hatfields lost land to the McCoys. However, there's also another one posted there that uh, states it began because of a disagreement over the selling of some hogs. And others say that disagreement began because of a love affair. Um, the actual beginning, no one knows for sure, but they can tell you almost the day that the greatest violence started taking place. But this one involved two state governments before it was over with. There were between 12 and 20 deaths and with a legal execution in the 1900s, the 20th century, it finally ended the feud. And of course the New York Times covered it all. And not just the New York Times, all your big city newspapers were coming to Eastern Kentucky to document the violence. There was the Anna Strong Little, which was the longest lasting feud. It lasted almost 68 years. Now each feud, of course, was different in details and causes, but they did have some similarities. The leading citizens of the counties were usually involved. And these leading citizens usually owned a business or were successful in some other way. And of course the code of honor. We must maintain our honor. Although if, since you have read the text, I'm sure that you have the same question I do. How does tying three teenage boys to bushes and blowing the hell out of them? What's that got to do with honor? And most of them involved some kind of battle around the courthouse. Now, Several years ago, my youngest son decided he wanted to go to Moorhead College, which is a lovely little college at Moorhead up in eastern Kentucky. It's nestled back in the hill. It's beautiful. And while the students were undergoing the orientation, the school uh, sprang for an orientation for the parents. And at first they took us on a boat ride and fed us a picnic lunch. And then they took us downtown, big town of Moorhead. And the old courthouse had been turned into a little theater. And they proceeded to put on, um, in the round, if you would, one of the feuds. And I thought, you know, this is going to be about as boring as it can get. I mean, what do I, his people running around playing dress up just didn't interest me at all. Because they had people in costume, period costume, and they would take the parts of the various members of the feud, and they would involve you into it. They'd ask you, did you see so-and-so? The sheriff would interview you. They'd bring you some cornbread and beans and ask you to sit on the jury. And I, in all honesty, I'm ashamed to admit I was wrong. Within 15-20 minutes I was into it and you just kind of slip into the mode and if you ever get a chance to go to theater in the round or get to go to a murder mystery thing, do. Uh, don't go in hard-headed like I did and say it's just going to be boring. Uh, go in with an open mind and I think you'll find you enjoy it and you slip into it so casually that you don't even realize you're into it. But they did a real great job recreating a feud. Uh, now back to the PowerPoint. Most of the feuds began with what they called the Troubles, which is their euphemism for the Civil War. And it could be something as simple as two people who owned a store across the street from each other have a disagreement over competition or prices or uh, your horse kicked my horse or my daughter did this, you know, something stupid that you get angry about and without realizing before you know it, the anger turns to violence. And when there's violence, someone gets hurt. And if your brother gets hurt, you want revenge upon the person who hurt. And before you know it, it just escalates totally out of control. Part of the reason, well, sociologists have been looking at it for decades. And we have narrowed it down to a couple of reasons. Isolation is one of them. Uh, you don't read about feuds taking place in Frankfurt or Louisville. It's always in small, isolated communities. The availability of weapons. 
And of course, every guy that lives in the mountains has a rifle to go hunting with. So you've got guns, and you know how to use them. Economic rivalries goes right back to businesses, remember? The leader of the clan usually owned a business and was successful. And of course, different political viewpoints. The results, well, of course, Kentucky and the Appalachian area became known as the very violent, the most violent of all the states in the, in the country. And with all this violence, of course, you have, again, out-migration. And when you have out-migration, you have businesses are going to suffer because you don't have people to run businesses or to purchase. And when businesses suffer, of course, then the county themselves suffer. You've got a growth decline, both in population and in economics. But the sad thing was one of the results is the public perception, not just the Kentuckians on Kentuckians, it's people outside our state. They looked at us as only being two kinds of Kentuckians. The contemporary ancestry, which of course your text describes beautifully as being the old forgotten people living out in the mountains who sit gently on their front porch and the wife plays a dulcimer and they rock in their chairs and they sing songs and they maintain the old ways and, and they speak with a very Elizabethan accent. But of course the one most everybody knows and recognizes as a Kentuckian is the bearded feudist. He's a guy who tromps around with a uncut hair, hat, probably got a few holes in it, bib overalls with one of the straps hanging down, and jug of whiskey in one hand and a loaded rifle in the other. And most people thought all Kentuckians were either feudists, assassins, savages, or of course we all married our cousins, that's why we had inbreeding. And there's no place to live like Kentucky, which is a very nice place to live if you enjoy anarchy and violence. I'm sorry folks, I had forgotten how much politics was in this chapter. I'm going to briefly go through the six governors who served in our state between 1875 and 1899. Uh, there were six of them. I'll go through very briefly and just hit the highlights. James B. McCary he was governor from 1875 to 1879, so he became governor right about the time that uh, Reconstruction ended in the South. Former Confederate officer, and which was almost a requirement to become an elected official back in those days. And during his tenure, there was a lot of labor unrest. Because the economy was in a bit of a downturn, railroads started slashing wages. And when the wages were slashed, of course, there were strikes. One of the good things he did get accomplished was the board, uh, excuse me, the Bureau of Agriculture. And because of our health concerns, I mean, cholera, smallpox, yellow fever, typhoid, they were rampant in our state, and he helped get a state board of health established, which I consider that his most important contribution. We had no health regulations, and because of lack of sanitation at home, both at home and at work, it, it was bad. It's something as simple as not wearing shoes in the summer. And like I told you last chapter, I didn't wear shoes in the summer myself. But you could get hookworm, and hookworm could lead to blindness. And how do you get hookworm? Well, basically by stepping in thesis from an animal like a cat. And you get into your foot and you don't even realize it. Poor ventilation. We used to have an expression when I was young that they were so poor that you could throw a cat through the wall and never touch a board. That got yeah, poor ventilation. That's really too much ventilation. But bad ventilation or poor ventilation could cause lung problems and that could lead to tuberculosis. And even though it was <clears throat> some time after he got the Board of Health established, in 1900, Paducah had the distinction of being the second highest rate of typhoid and the third highest rate of malaria in the entire country. Not a distinction we were proud of. But we had plenty of doctors. Well, quacks. Of course, a quack is somebody who's got a cure for everything. They can sell you some horse liniment that's going to cure your warts or make you stand taller or get rid of your rheumatoid, rheumat your arthritis and your rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we could use electrical shock that could cure your love life. It, there, there wasn't anything that someone didn't come up with a magic cure for. And no regulations. Now, even if you'd gone to college and had a degree saying you were a doctor or a lawyer, there's still no guarantee because there's no rules and regulations. So we got a new Board of Health, and they tried to improve, but they had, our legislature didn't give them enough money to do anything. They had a very small budget. 
Meanwhile, the food that we're buying and eating, not necessarily what we're growing ourselves, but what we're buying, like in the canned goods and the meat markets, the quality is really down on the bottom. Because, I mean, the butcher didn't wash his hands. He could drop a piece of meat on the floor and pick it up and sell it. The canned goods had rat pieces of rats and roaches and things in them. It was just really bad. Now, there was a Pure Food and Drug Act passed, but it was in 1898, which is after this gentleman's tenure. And once the offenders realized there was going to be repercussions, if they did do something wrong, the quality did improve. Meanwhile, because of all the upheaval in the economics of our country, um, political parties are beginning to form in response to it. And one of them that formed was called the Grange. Now, the Grange was an association of farmers. Now, they weren't trying to do anything political. They were just trying to start out as a social group. And since they were against the Republicans and against the Democrats, they began to support a party called the Greenback Party, who had a cure for the nation's woes. If there's not enough money in circulation, just print more money. But these cooperatives that the Grange wanted to be formed were basically where you sell your own products at a make a profit and uh, put your food or your crops into storage and the government lends you money to live on until the prices go up. But the Democrats and the Republicans, as more and more the farmers begin to organize, they saw it as a threat to their party. And of course this depression is causing massive layoffs and when you have massive layoffs you begin to see labor unions go out on strikes. The next governor is Dr. Luke Breyer Blackburn. Now, he had troubles in the beginning because there he had southern leanings. And there was the rumor that he was trying to infect the northern cities with yellow fever. But in reality, as uh, I said, rumor. Uh, it was never proven for true or false. He did fight the disease, yellow fever, all across the south. And in 1878, he actually won an award for his work. The main thing you can remember him for is, well, I shall say, the attempt at prison reform. He decided the prisons were overcrowded, surprise. Uh, the prisoners were being leased out or hired out as slave labor, and they would work in conditions that were, you wouldn't put your dog in. Seven percent of them died in jail. The guards were untrained. Prisoners would be whipped. The food was totally unedible. There was no parole system. Now, he decided the way to relieve the overcrowding was to pardon the prisoners. So he got the name, and I, AKA also known as Lenient Luke because of his pardons. But there was some small reforms. He managed to get the legislature to approve a new prison, but no money to build it. And they're still leasing out prisoners. But he did do some good. He raised the property tax, which gave the uh, state more money. He cut state salaries. He improved navigation on the Ohio River. And he reorganized the court system, so he did do some small good. Jay Proctor Knock was the next governor. He's a former several-term congressman. But like the previous governors, he was sometimes unable to get reforms passed because the legislature wouldn't pass the money or come up with the money to do anything. And he also continued the uh, policy of pardoning prisoners. But he created this Kentucky State Normal School for Colored Persons in Frankfurt, which I think is a very noble thing for him to have done. He did raise property taxes again, and he provided for a uniform assessment program in the state. And of course, the next governor is one of my most favored Southern people, Simon Bolivar Butler. You remember him from last chapter. He was the Confederate general who had to surrender Fort Donaldson to General Grant. And when Grant asked him if he had the money to buy the privileges that a Confederate officer should have, he didn't have it, so General Grant, the Union officer, lent him the money. And I told you then, he did pay him back. He also, as pointed out in your text, acted as a pallbearer when General Grant died. Simon Boulevard Buckner was the epitome of a Kentucky gentleman. After the war, he uh, became very wealthy. He was wealthy before the war, but he was not allowed to come back to Kentucky for a while because he was a Confederate general, so he stayed down in, in New Orleans and became very wealthy. He comes back to Kentucky, uh, never held a political office until 1888. He was 64 years old when he was elected. And I just put that down there that, you know, he was 64, his wife was 30, and they had a brand new baby. Okie dokie. 
but the state's having internal money problems. And we didn't have enough money in the treasury to pay our bills, so he takes money out of his pocket and lends the state the money. I thought that was phenomenal. He also didn't like some of the bills that were coming out of the legislature, and he developed a reputation for vetoing more bills than any other governor ever had. He's also got violence still going on because the Hatfield-McCoy feud is going on during his tenure, as well as another little incident. A man called James W. Tate, known as Honest Dick, was the state treasurer. And I hope you found that particular story very interesting. I thought it was funny the first time I read it. Mr. Tate, the state treasurer, decided one day to take a little trip to Lexington, or maybe to go on up into Cincinnati, and he left. Fine and dandy. Uh, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Pretty soon people start to get worried. Where is he and why is he not coming back? So they go to his office and they discover the office is rather chaotic. There are bills that are marked paid that haven't been paid. There are bills that have been paid that have never been posted as being paid. Uh, and there's a lot of money gone. They did an audit and they discovered that $247,000 was no longer in the state treasury, which doesn't seem like a lot of money to us today, but you're looking in the 1890s, so take that sum and multiply it by about 14, and you'll see what it would be equivalent to today's terms, be several millions of dollars. Uh, it seems that uh, Mr. Tate had loaned money friend, to friends, he'd loaned money to politicians, he'd even loaned money to a governor. He had taken some of the state's money and invested in land and gold and silver. Uh, he was using the state's money as his own money. Because, I mean, he was such a good guy, everybody loved him. If you needed money or any help, just go talk to Honest Dick and he'd help you out. Well, of course, when the money was discovered gone and him being gone, they impeached him immediately and filed criminal charges. And it's called locking the barn door after the horse is stolen. Good old expression. After the embezzlement, they created the Office of State Inspector so that this would not ever happen again. And I thought it was funny, and I hope you did too, that after the scandal broke, uh, people who he had loaned money to who never repaid it, well, some long overdue loans were suddenly being repaid. But you and I hear about this, and, you know, our trust in our elected officials has kind of go downhill in a handbasket. And, of course, the question is, where is Tate? Well, they say that letters were received from Canada, the Orient, and California, and as far away as Brazil. Uh, but where is Tate? Where's the money? He left his wife and children here. And this doesn't exactly make us trust our public officials, does it? Meanwhile, in Frankfurt, in September of 1890, they uh, decided we needed to revise that 1850 Constitution because when it had been written, we still had slavery. And so some of those laws were ridiculous. They wanted to take care of them. So they met for 226 days. It's called the uh, Long Parliament, named after an English parliament that met for several years in London a couple of centuries ago. There were 60 lawyers and 20 farmers and 13 doctors and 7 businessmen. There was a former governor and a future governor. And they're all educated males. And But each one of them were speaking for issues for their constituents and not really wanting to work together. So not much was really decided. But they did set a time limit for officials to be in office. Now, in my text, it's on page 265, there is a list of five changes that were made. I would be a good idea for you to check them out before you take your test and your quiz. So after all the changes are made, they present it to the public, and the public votes on it and passes it. And then the delegates meet again and revise some of the things that were in there and did not put it to the public vote. So the new constitution was adopted in 1891. In 1892, a mammoth depression hit the entire United States. And something like between 25 and 30 percent of our population was out of work. We had major businesses fail. Uh, even the new um, camera companies were failing. And 
it, it just was not a good time. And it all got started because of massive dumping of the stock on the stock market. And it rolls downhill. Um, banks withhold money. Uh, you haven't got the money to shop. And pretty soon banks fail, businesses fail. You're hurt in the cities. You're hurt out in the farmland. And of course, when people get laid off, we start having strikes. So in general, everybody's unhappy, not just in Kentucky, nationwide, but everybody's unhappy with the current politics of politicians. So new political parties are starting to form. And one of them was the People's or Populist Party, which we hear about today even. Uh, now the Populist Party basically had metamorphosed from the old range. They decided that just supporting another political party wasn't the way to go. They needed to go from being a social group to being active in politics. And their platform included some very interesting things like graduated income tax, a direct election of senators. Because prior to this time, uh, we elected the uh, legislature officials, but the senators were elected by the legislature. They wanted government regulations and they called for free silver. Now, free silver does not mean they want the government to give everybody a piece of free silver. Free silver simply means they want the government to buy all silver that is mined. At this time, silver was worth about one sixteenth of what gold was per ounce. And the government had a regulation, the Sherman Silver Act, where they would buy, in the beginning, so many dollars worth of silver. And they eventually changed it to they buy so many ounces of silver. But every country in the world, except Mexico, had gone on the gold standard. They used gold to back their, their uh, economics. We were using both. People looked at silver, it was pure, it was clean, it was western. It's those silly people in the big cities who want the gold. Well, The Wizard of Oz was written in response to this problem. Uh, originally in the story, Dorothy did not have red slippers, she had silver slippers that she walked on the golden road. Uh, and each character in the story relates to like the Wicked Witch and the Monkeys, and they all pertain to different characters that were on the life stage. But free silver is simply a big battle between what well, the urbanites couldn't have cared less. The rural people were sure silver was the cure of all of our problems. By at the government, by all silver that's mined. John Brown becomes governor during this time frame, and uh, he's from Henderson. And while he was a governor, the legislature began to look at some of the old laws, because with that new uh, constitution, we had to get rid of and change the laws. Brown had trouble getting along not only with his cabinet, but his own lieutenant governor. But the thing to remember about him is he got some rights to marry women about property. It was also during his tenure that the famous Plessy, Plessy v. Ferguson Supreme Court decision was handed down stating that um, you didn't have to have totally equal because of the 14th Amendment between black and white. You could have separate facilities as long as they were equal. And it became the law of the land of the 1950s. Uh, you know, there were very definitely many separate facilities, separate water fountains and separate funeral parlors and separate swimming areas, but of course they were never equal. Governor Brown got some coal mine safety regulations change, and he managed to prevent a merger of the couple of railroads to, to stop having a humongous monopoly and even a more powerful lobby. Nationwide, this depression was more than a temporary hiccup in the economics of the nation. It started in 92 and it didn't really get over with till about 96, where it before it had been a few months or maybe a year, this had gone on for years. And since you have to have someone to blame, I mean, you want to work. But if there's no jobs to be had, who do you blame? It's not your fault. So you blame the president or you blame your governor. So because of this depression and massive unemployment, we had an unpopular president and an unpopular Kentucky governor. Meanwhile, the Republicans in our state are starting to smell victory. And then a Republican, William McKinley, is elected president. The outgoing president was a Democrat, by the way. Meanwhile, the Kentucky Democrats they they can't get along. They're fighting amongst themselves. They, they say this party is splintering. And the Republicans actually elect a governor. William O'Connell Bradley. Yes, he was a Republican, but we did have a uh, Democratic legislature. As a matter of fact, most legislatures in Kentucky would stay Democratic. 
it seemed like once the Republicans got in as a president and a governor of our state, they changed some of their modus operandi. They'd always been known as a party of Lincoln, the Reform Party, the Civil Rights Party, but now we're starting to pull in our horns and get very conservative. Meanwhile, the Democrats are changing their coats too, and they're going to be seen as the new reformers. They kind of switch positions. Now, Governor Bradley had to deal with state violence too, because the feuds are still going on. And we've got people in our state who are angry over the Depression. We're also angry over these road taxes. And just like we did back at the Revolutionary War, we didn't want to pay that infamous English stamp tax, so we burned the stamps instead of paying the tax and harassed the stamp collectors. We burned the toll gates and started harassing the toll gate keepers. And it was almost class warfare. In the 1890s, because of industrialization, the unequal distribution of wealth, the distance between the haves and the have-nots was really growing. We had ultra, ultra millionaires who lived very ostentatiously, and then you had people who were, well, everybody in the family had to work, the husband, the wife, the children, everybody had to work to, to be able to have a decent living. So you were almost having a class warfare. With the Depression, fortunately, started ending in 1896. Things started getting better. We started having some good weather nationwide, and crops picked up, and we're selling good crops, and people are working, and then we have a war with Spain, the Spanish-American War. Of course, Kentucky soldiers did go fight in it. And I thought it was so sad that even though we had more than 5,000 men die in that war, most of them died because of sickness, yellow fever, heat prostration, um, in the camps, poor sanitation, and with the six soldiers waiting to come back, our government didn't have enough money to pay for the hospital trains to bring them back. So Governor Bradley ended up having to borrow money from a bank, hoping that the General Assembly would reimburse the plan, and 84 Kentuckians did not make it back. They died before they could even get back. Now, the Spanish-American War, according to American historians, it was a jolly little war, a splendid little war, a short little war. It lasted six weeks. We only lost 5,000 men. And because of it, we wound up being an imperialistic country. We got Cuba and a bunch of other islands, which we're not going to go into. That's American history. But it turned out not to be such a good war for us here in Kentucky. Yeah. I'm going to stop here because the last page and a half of this chapter talks about Goebel. And I want to do Goebel from beginning to end, so we'll do him in the next chapter. Now, I'm sorry, I didn't mean for this to be as long as it's been, but the end of the century politics, both in our state and our nation, well, you've got so much going on. You've got the Depression going on. You've got massive industrialization out of control. You've got trusts. You've got monopolies. You've got a war. Ah, it, there's just a lot going on in the 1890s, and it's paving the way for the entrance into the 20th century. And before you can turn around and say Jack Robinson, you're going to have a world war. So to answer your question before you ask it, no, I did not ask a lot of details about the governor, the six governors we just talked about. But it wouldn't hurt to know what they were best known for. And of course, if you have not already, I suggest you read the chapter get a little details on the feuds and especially those five changes in the, in the Constitution. Now, chapter 18 is only 19 pages long. It's much, much more interesting. Uh, the title of the chapter, Progressivism, Prohibition, and Politics, 1900 to 1920, which is only 20 years. But man, there is so much stuff going on in that 20 years. It makes the last 20 years look like snail's pace. That being said, I look forward to the next chapter.